When we left Luther in our Luther Part 2 lecture, he'd just returned to Wittenberg and cast out the Zwickau prophets, undone some of his good friend and mentor Karlstadt's reforms, and begun working with the authorities to control the Reformation and ensure it was more moderate and socially acceptable. But for all of his desires, Luther could not control the Reformation nor the civil unrest that was sweeping the land. As mentioned in previous lectures, looking at the root causes of the Reformation, especially the sociological upheavals of the past century and the growth of nationalism, this was a time of significant societal change and unrest in Europe. It was a time of new ideas and new discoveries in science and religion and class and politics and identity and even new discoveries in the world itself. Since the early 1300s through to the end of the mid-1500s, where Luther now is, there were a series of revolts by the peasants across Europe. The peasants were the very bottom rung of society, often farmers and the like. And as the distance in wealth between the rich becoming super rich and the poor becoming poorer expanded, and as the, the middle class developed and pushed the poorer even further down, while they became more comfortable as a middle class below the super rich who were getting richer but far above the downtrodden poor, it's perhaps no surprise that these peasantry would actually turn to revolution. The printing press and the explosion of ideas and mild education meant that suddenly these revolts began taking on a slightly different tone. And so began what was known as the German Peasants' War between 1524 and 1525. And the German Peasants' War was not a solidified movement, a civil war in that sense, but it was a string of revolts which swept across much of the centre of the Holy Roman Empire. Spurred on by radical Anabaptists like Thomas Munzer, who we'll look at another time, many in this revolt and rebellion saw their cause as a religious struggle for freedom. They thought that the great Martin Luther, the herald of the Reformation, the one who started it all, who sacrificed so much, would support them. They'd heard his tracks, they'd read his writings, they knew how he railed with incredibly strong language against the corruption and injustice and power and perversions of the Roman church. Luther would surely champion their cause and lead them to victory. But Martin Luther did not. Although at first he was sympathetic towards the peasant cause, he always maintained a stance that any actions which broke the peace were not good or from God. But as things really heated up in 1525 and the revolts became almost nationwide across the empire, Luther went from cold perhaps somewhat sympathetic indifference, and turned against them. In his subtly named work, Against the Robbing, Murderous Hordes of Peasants, Luther was never one for subtlety, Luther called on the state and the nobles to utterly stamp out rebellions. Luther said in that work, and I quote, The peasants must be sliced, choked, stabbed secretly in public by those who can, like one must kill a rabid dog. By the time the Peasants' War had ended, between 100,000 and 300,000 peasants had been killed. Luther himself would later declare, I, Martin Luther, have during the rebellion slain all the peasants, for it was I who ordered them to be struck dead. And just as Luther was becoming more entwined into the secular politics and matters of ruling, so he increased his control over the Protestant church. 
Seeing the idea of local congregations appointing their own clergy as something unworkable, something dysfunctional and broken, Luther moved to control more and more of the church, including its appointments. He introduced new forms of worship which had to be followed, two teaching documents called catechisms that outlined acceptable teaching, and lacking an episcopacy, that is a government by bishops like the Church of Rome had, he instead used and relied on the elector Count of Saxony, the local secular ruler, to enforce these changes and ensure they were followed by local churches. Inch by inch, Luther was giving more and more power over the church to the state. And of course, what the state most wanted and what Luther also seems to have wanted following the rashness and violence and death of the Peasants' Revolt, was peace. And so, at this stage, many of Luther's most radical stances and proposed changes to the Church from earlier in the Reformation were watered down. Compromise for the sake of peace at home was key, which is so odd and ironic because it's at this very time where compromising with the reformers in Switzerland by agreeing some kind of united Protestantism, agreeing on the Lord's Supper, compromising to unite with Zwingli and Butzer was still considered by Martin Luther to be filthy and disgusting. And yet at this same time, 1529, his own liturgies for the church, which he was proposing and having enforced, retained the elevation of the bread and wine. They allowed Roman vestments and altars and lit candles and the like that the Swiss saw as clearly a compromise towards Rome. In 1539, so tied to the interests of the state, Luther even counselled that the local ruler of Hesse could also marry the lady-in-waiting of his wife and be in a bigamous marriage, because that's what the ruler wanted. But Luther said it was best to keep that secret. Of course, when the news leaked, Luther was in trouble, and he advised the ruler of Hesse, and these are the words of Luther, to tell a good, strong lie. The scandal caused the serious damage to Luther's reputation over his allowing and saying it was okay to be in a bigamous marriage and telling him to lie openly. Well, it's hard to, to grasp how big that damage was and it is so hard to imagine the early Luther giving such unbiblical advice. And a similar change was seen in the attitude to the peasants, uh, also seen to the externals of the Roman mass, to the state. Those changes are also seen in his attitude towards the Jews. Though he was never particularly positive towards the Jews, Luther moved from in the early stage of the Reformation, advising kindness towards them and promoting evangelism to Jews in his 1523 work that Jesus Christ was born a Jew, to in 1543, 21 years later, publishing the 60,000 word bile filled on the Jews and their lies. In this work and other later works, Luther calls the Jews the people of the devil. And he promoted setting their synagogues on fire, burning their books, seizing their property and possessions and forcing them into hard labour till they left the local area. Luther would even say, we are not at fault, or rather sorry, Luther would say, we are at fault in not slaying them. We are at fault in not slaying the Jews. Now, as horrendous as that is, there's no reducing that, it is worth mentioning that such anti-Semitism was common across the continent in both Protestant and Roman circles. Luther's arch-nemesis in Rome, Johann Eck, would write equally, if not worse, things about the Jews. 
Likewise, both Butzer and Melanchthon counselled the ruler of Hesse that his bigamous marriage would be permissible. After many years of ill health, Luther died in 1546, aged 62. And though he was the herald of the Reformation and the father who gave his name to Lutheranism, it was actually his successor and protégé, Philip Melanchthon, that had the job of systematising and organising Lutheran thinking. You see, Luther was not much of a systematizer. He was a polemicist. He was an impulsive speaker and writer who didn't care about fine details so long as the message got across. And this is why it was so tragic that John Wycliffe lived before a printing press, because he combined both the best of the fiery, impulsive Luther and the calm and collected, systematic, logical Melanchthon. As it was, it was Melanchthon who had to pick up the pieces of Luther's often disjointed thinking and writings. Born in 1497, Melanchthon was educated as a child and influenced by the humanists who loved their Greek, which is why the young Philip and I'm probably going to pronounce this horribly wrong, Philip Schwarzschild, which is a name that means Black Earth, changed his German name to the Greek name of the same meaning, Melanchthon. Studying at both Heidelberg, where he was denied a master's degree because despite his ability to do it, he was seen as too young, and at Tübingen, before he was appointed professor at Greek at Wittenberg University, Melanchthon showed his skills. And it was at the age of 21 that he was appointed professor of Greek at Wittenberg University by Luther himself. Melanchthon was a strong supporter of Luther in print, but he was also ever a timid individual, lacking courage and struggling to find his voice and confidence in the presence of people who were more naturally charismatic. And so, when the Zwickau prophets came to Wittenberg during the time that Luther was hiding in Wartburg, pretending to be Junker Hjorge, Melanchthon felt out of his depth and overwhelmed by their charismatic manner, and he is the one who compelled Luther to return and take charge of things. Perhaps Melanchthon's most significant work is what is called the Augsburg Confession, based on various bits of Luther's works, but prepared and systematised and expanded by Melanchthon, this confession of faith was presented to the Diet of Augsburg in 1530. Now, the Diet of Augsburg was a gathering of key leaders of the Holy Roman Empire to discuss the threat of the Ottoman Empire, to discuss matters of state, and finally to discuss the issue of the Reformation, which had so unsettled the land. Forget not the hundred to three hundred thousand dead German peasants of the previous decade. And the Augsburg Confession was designed to be presented to the Diet, to the Parliament, as a kind of universal expression of the faith of the Church, something both Protestants and Romans could agree on and find some common ground. To which end, for example, it says nothing about the powers of the Pope or the role of the papacy over which Protestants and Romans would clearly disagree. Of course, this didn't actually work out at all, and the Romanists were having none of this Augsburg Confession. The Protestant princes in the Holy Roman Empire formed the uh, Schimalkaldic, Schimalkaldic Lead League, which required agreement with either the Augsburg Confession or the Tetrapolitan Confession of Martin Butzer in order for you to join this League of Protestants. Schimalkadic League. I'm not great at my German pronunciations. But with this new League of powerful Protestant princes and with a 300,000-man Ottoman army marching into Austria, 
Emperor Charles V and his Catholic allies largely let the Reformation rumble on and spread. And there was a period of peace that lasted till 1546, when Charles finally made peace with the King of France, who he was at war with, and with the Ottoman Empire, and he could finally turn his focus inwards towards the Protestants that he so hated. Despite having superior armed forces to the Holy Roman Emperor himself, the League lacked unity and leadership, and so it lost the war in the year 1547. But by the time it lost this war, Protestantism was too deeply ingrained in the lands. Too many people held their Protestant beliefs too deeply for military force or, or threat of law to possibly stamp it out. After all, many of the lawmen who would be doing the prosecuting were convinced Protestants themselves. And so a second war began in 1552 where, backed by France, who ironically were busy violently stamping out their own brand of Protestantism in their own lands, the Protestants of the Holy Roman Empire won and they forced the Holy Roman Emperor to flee to his ancestral lands in Austria. In August 1555, the Emperor formally recognised the validity of the Augsburg Confession that Melanchthon had prepared and granted Lutheranism official status within the Empire, leaving it up to the individual princes and counts to choose if their states were to be Protestant or Roman. Melanchthon himself would continue his academic career throughout this time in relative quiet after the Diet of Augsburg in 1530. He would greatly clarify the idea that to be justified in the Bible meant to be accounted just and not to be made just. Like Butzer, Melanchthon was more conciliatory when it came to the matter of the Lord's Supper, but he remained firmly in the Lutheran camp. Whilst on the matter of free will, human free will and predestination, he would depart from Luther's strongly deterministic views and embrace a more synergistic approach, siding with Erasmus against Luther on what is known as the bondage of the human will. Melanchthon would die in 1560. Now, Luther would speak of the relationship that he had with Melanchthon in this way. I had to fight with rabble and devils, for which reason my books are very warlike. I am the rough pioneer who must break the road. But Master Philip, Master Philip comes along softly and gently sows and waters heartily, since God has richly endowed him with gifts. Theirs was a love-hate relationship, as it were, with Luther often unhappy with Melanchthon's seemingly cowardly actions, but in return Melanchthon often feeling that Luther was a humiliating bully who berated him for his useless anxieties and for being weak. Whilst Luther always took the centre stage in dramatic fashion, Melanchthon, bless him, would even write speeches and works for his friends and let them use their own name and signature on them instead of his. It was never about his glory for Melanchthon. Whilst Luther was much more mystical in his understanding of the faith and the Lord's Supper and much of the Christian life, Melanchthon was relentlessly academic and scientific and logical. And so between the dynamic duo of Luther and Melanchthon, Lutheranism itself gained its unique flavour among the Protestant churches which it keeps to this very day. Now, next session we will turn to consider a key part of the peasant revolts against which Luther so harshly turned, and with that the final part of the continental Protestant puzzle, as it were, the Radical Reformation and the Anabaptists. <laughs>